Good afternoon. Uh, I'm continuing uh, the exposition of Philippians, and uh, this is the fourth me message. And today I'm extra, extra excited because this carries the verse that carried my life for the last 35 years. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If you could just look at me with some energy. Yeah. Could you do that? Because word is not worship, but it is central to worship. If you are here to worship, I'm asking you to really give your ears. Okay. The title of the message for today is Christ will be exalted or honored, whether by life or whether by death. Could you look at the title? Uh, Christ will be exalted, whether by life or whether by death. Do you think this person, who, whoever is saying this, uh, Christ and or gospel is important to him? The question that I would like to raise is, Paul, who's writing this, what is the place of the gospel in this person's life. Okay? But the, the question I really want to ask is, what is the place of the gospel in God's heart and God's mind, in Christianity? And obviously that will ask, you know, naturally make you think, what is the place of the gospel in your life? Right? I think that's what this message is about. And uh, it, it sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? Uh, I don't know how many of you are watching World Cup soccer going on right now, and uh, South Korea made to uh, top 16, and they just beat uh, Portugal uh, against all odds, yeah, with you know only 9% of chance of winning, whatever that means. But they actually beat them and made it to top 16. And uh, I mean, that's kind of exciting, but what I want to bring up is not that. The leader of South Korean team is a uh, soccer superstar in EPL, uh, English Premier League. He plays for Tottenham Spurs, and his name is Hung Min Son, okay, Sony. And after the game, I don't know whether you saw this, after the game, he was on the floor, he was on the ground, and he was wailing. And that really moved me. My question is, what does soccer or winning the World Cup mean to him? He's about uh, uh, Pastor Paul Park's age, okay? He's about 31. Sorry to reveal your age. <laughs> He's getting up there. So it may, it may be his last World Cup. For the last 20 years, that's what his life was about. And my question to you is, the reason that it moves me is, what about... Paul's heart toward the gospel. Would, do you think it's any less than that? Let alone, what about the heart of God toward the gospel? Do you think it's less than those soccer players try to win the World Cup? Enough so, so that he was on the floor. He does, it doesn't matter whether the world was watching or not. He was so emotional and crying. I don't know about you, but it moves me. I, ne I love people with passion. Uh, are you passionate about the gospel? What is the place of the gospel in your life? Okay. Paul is in Rome. How many of you have been to Rome? It's a pretty amazing place, actually. Paul was in Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire. That was like the capital center of the secular world. And it's kind of interesting because we are living in New York, which is kind of like the capital of the world right now. It's not the capital of uh, U.S. or anything, but you know what I mean. New York City is no small city. Washington, D.C., New York is like the, uh, the capital of the current world. And Paul is in Rome, but he was in a prison. How did he end up there? Wow. What happened? How did Paul end up in the capital of the city and he was actually waiting for the verdict from Caesar himself, the emperor? 
That's a pretty big deal, right? To answer the question, you need to read the scripture. Book of Acts is the historical recording of how Christianity that started on that hill of Jewish Messiah being killed and crucified. That little story kind of like spread all over Judea. That's more like East Coast for us. Can you imagine a story like that? It's all over the East Coast. And then to Samaria, maybe covering entire North, uh, North America. And then to Syria, Asia Minor, Asia, Turkey, present Turkey. And then the gospel, that story of that Jewish Messiah being crucified, a Roman uh, execution, went to Europe. How many of you have been to Europe? That's your dream, isn't it? You want to go to these places. Gospel actually went to Greece, northern Greece, called Macedonia, and Philippi is in that Macedonia, and then it went west further, all the way to Rome. Are you picturing this? And then eventually from there, it'll go to Spain. How many of you have you been to Spain? I've never been to Spain. But in order for you to go to Spain, from Italy, probably they went through France. And it doesn't stop there. From Spain and in, uh, France and, and all these European countries, it ended up going to England. And then to North America, to United States. I'm talking about, about just 100 years ago now, 150 years ago. And then the gospel went to Asia, to China, Japan, and Korea. And then to South America. And then to Africa. Do you see the advancement of the gospel? That's what this is about. And it's actually recorded in the book of Acts. Okay? And uh, this week I was just reading through Acts over and over again. Try to see how did that happen. He was arrested in Jerusalem, which is a small country of Palestine. Right? And he was transported from Jerusalem all the way to Caesarea, and then all the way to Rome. Can I just show you the map? For those of you who have no clue what I'm... Here we go. This is the actual map of the world. This is Jerusalem, Palestine. Okay? From all the way from Jerusalem, through Asia, Turkey, and through Greece, and to Italy, to Rome. And Paul is in Rome. So what I am sharing is that we're not talking about fairy tales. We're not talking about um, fictional stuff. We're talking about historical writings. Are you listening? Christianity is, a, is based upon historical truth. A lot of people totally miss, miss out. It's all about just fairy tales and stories, and you get the morals. So how we can live good life. Absolutely wrong. His death is historical. His resurrection is historical. His ascension is historical. Him coming back will be historical. Are you listening? So it is about the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And interesting fact is, I'm just giving you the backdrop of the Philippians. His arrest was uh, in what chapter? Chapter 20. And the book of Acts is made up of 28 chapters. And from chapter 20 all the way to 28, Eight chapters out of 28 chapters is about his transportation from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. You must think then, why is that so highlighted? What is that about? Don't you, shouldn't, you, shouldn't you think that? If you are a logical student of the Bible, if you're interested in what God is doing in history, what this is, life is about, you should ask questions like that. Why is that so highlighted? Eight chapters of one person being transported from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. It's kind of highlighted. And uh, if you know Book of Acts, if you read it, it's like one of those movies where the movie is ending, but movie is not really ending. Do you know what I'm talking about? There are movies like that, right? Uh, Lord of the Ring Part 1. Okay? You know this movie is not ending. 
Something is continuing. And that's how this book ends. Paul in Rome, in prison, in house arrest, spreading the gospel to the people who are visiting him. He's arrested, but people visit him, and the gospel advances. Do you see that? That's what we see in the book of Acts. It's pretty amazing if you think about it. So how did Paul end up in Rome? It's the plan of God. It's the providence of God. It was what God intended. My question to you is, how, how did you end up here? Why do you live in New York? Because my parents gave me a birth and I was born in Flushing Hospital. Don't bother me. Right? Is that how you think? That's not why. Right? Something about God's story and God's history, and I hope you're part of it. I hope you're part of it, okay? This is the historical backdrop of Philippians, and Philippians picks up right there from chapter 28 of the book of Acts. Okay, so what happened when Paul arrived as a Jewish missionary? He was a Hellenistic Jew, which means he was a second generation or third generation uh, Jewish uh, Roman. Just like second generation, third generation, Asian American, Korean American, whatever your status is. There is correlation, people. Okay? So what happened there? That's exactly what today's is text about is, is about. Very historical, and hopefully it will be meaningful to you. And Paul is basically saying here, this is what happened, the, under the title, The Advance of the Gospel. So he ended up in Rome. He was, he was arrested and was transported. He almost died by shipwreck, and he was in prison in Caesarea for a couple of years. And uh, he ended up in Rome, Roman prison. And this is what he says. I want you to know, brothers, he's writing to the church in Philippi, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served the advance of the gospel. And I was reading this, and I was just so blessed. You know, I came to this country 45 years ago. I was 14 years old, and it's been 45 years. And what is my life about? I do think about things like that. I don't know whether you do, but I do. Is my life about becoming a dentist and and make a somewhat affluent living, raising my children, and then go to further schooling and become an ordained pastor, and eventually selling my practice and planting a church. And my children are growing up, and we don't have a huge congregation or anything like that. So what is my life about? I do think, think about things like that. Okay. And I like to believe it is for the advancement of the gospel. I personally, it's for the advancement of the gospel. In fact, I am pretty convinced that it is for the gospel. I'm talking about my life. You may disagree. You may laugh at me, but I'm, I have that conviction about my life. And it really blesses my life. And Paul is saying, what has happened to me served the advance of the gospel. And I'm asking you, what is your life about? Right? It served me. So how did it serve? Two ways, okay? It's really interesting if you, if you listen to this, okay? Verse 13 and 14. How did the gospel advance through imprisonment or transportation of Paul from Palestine to Rome advanced the gospel in history, in God's story. Verse 13, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guards. He was a prisoner of the emperor. And the people, the soldiers who were taking care of these prisoners were imperial guards, 9,000 of them. Can you imagine some Really highly skilled, devoted soldiers need to protect Caesar and Rome. These are the best soldiers. 9,000 of them, hand-picked, probably the best trained, best shaped, uh, 
They get double pay and they get pension. This is from my reading, historically speaking. 9,000 of them. And Paul is saying, because of my imprisonment, it, be, it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. Could you picture that? That's pretty crazy, isn't it? He is the king. He's the lord of this entire uh, Roman Empire. And his soldiers, 9,000 of them, and his families, because of Paul, because he was there for a couple of years, he was arrested, and he was guarded by this imperial guards, all the rest, and, and, and uh, so the whole imperial guard, and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. That's how gospel advanced to Romans, Italians. Italians. Do you picture it? That's how gospel was preached in Italy. Pretty amazing if you think about it. Second way, it affects the church, Christians. How did it affect? Most of my brothers, because of my imprisonment, they became confident. My prayer is because of Pastor Paul Park's life that you will become more devoted and confident about the gospel. My prayer is through my life, hopefully, through my life and teaching, but more life, that you would want to become a Christian and follow Christ. That's what he's saying. Most of the brothers, having been confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, it affects you. My life affects you and your life affects me. Definitely does, right? Are much more bold to speak the word without fear. If I am always fearful of you and be, a, uh, you know, to offend you with the gospel, I cannot speak the truth to you. You really need to come to the Lord, and in order for you to do that, you need to turn and repent. If I hesitate to say that, you will not. You will not do that. Right? So it affects the church. So I want to just go back and explain to you a little bit about that's my imagination now. How imperial guards, the soldiers who were guarding Paul became Christian. Okay? Historically, imperial prisoners were handcuffed with the people who are, uh, uh, who are guarding them. So there is a young soldier, well-trained Roman soldier, gla uh, not gladi gladiator, but you know, Roman soldier, and you're handcuffed with Paul. Can you picture? You are stuck with Paul for all night. So, wow, that's so mean. I mean, you know, there's no privacy, there, there's no rest, but I, I imagine this. Can you imagine in the, like, like say, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, it's dark, there's no TV, there's no internet, so they, they just talk. What do you think Paul talked about in the middle of that night under that moonlight of Rome? What do you think Paul talked about? Paul, with his mature Christian character, he was a godly man. It was toward his end of, end of his life. He wrote Romans by this, by, that, by this time. He wrote Corinthians by this time. He wrote so many things. I went through so many things. And he loves the Lord and he loves the souls. So intelligent, so organized, and, he, and this young soldier, you're stuck with him. What do you think Paul talked to him, talked to him about? Sharing about life. What is life about, young man? What is your life about? Tell me about your life. He probably talked about what's the meaning of life? What's the meaning of life? What, what are you, why are you striving so hard? Why are you working so hard? What are you going to do with that money that you make? Tell me about your family. Tell me about your parents. We know Romans were the worst sexually, uh, sexually speaking. It was like the sewers of the history, sexually speaking. Young man, tell me about you. Tell me, uh, tell me about yourself. So he talked about life, meaning of life, eternity, gospel, 
purpose of life. Can I just ask you, what is the purpose of your life? Where's your life going? Why are you so worried? Why are you are so anxious because you cannot control your life? Paul probably talked to him. You know, you could never control your life. He probably talked about God, eternity, purpose in life. With this young soldier who was stuck, poor guy, every night for like two, three years. What do you think would happen to a person like that? Just think about it, people. Not only that, these guards probably heard Paul teaching, talking, sharing with the visitors, right? With passion, with conviction. This is why I am here. You know, he probably heard, overheard indirectly how Paul uh, like talked to the people, how Jesus according to the scriptures, which was written hundreds of years ago, how he became a man. Right? He probably heard, they probably heard uh, about Jesus, according to the scripture, how he was executed in Roman ways on the cross. It's written in Deut Deuteronomy. Right? Curse is the man who hung on a tree. Is in Deuteronomy, people. Written hundreds, thousands, year, thousands of years ago, and it was fulfilled him in, in, in Christ. And how Jesus, according to the scripture, was raised historically. I saw him. I met him. He commissioned me. He actually told me, You're going to go to Rome if you read chapter 24. It is so interesting because he's in prison in Caesarea, and basically Jesus shows up in red letter and says, Just as you. Witness me in, here in Caesarea to the Jews. You're going to go to Rome. Jesus told him. If you read the rest of the chapters, they go into a major shipwreck. Everyone lost hope, and they were all going to die. But guess what? Paul didn't believe that he was, he was going to die. He basically told all the people in, in, in the boat, don't worry, people. Lord has spoken to me. Not a single person will be lost. So eat, eat, eat. Do you remember that chapter? It's pretty amazing. Because Jesus told him, you're going you're gonna to go to Rome. Not only that, they probably heard about this Jewish Messiah who was raised, right? Who was raised. He's alive and he's coming back historically. He's going to come back. And he's going to judge. What do you think would have happened to soldiers who heard all of these. They become believers. Who are they? Imperial guards of Caesar. It's pretty funny, isn't it? So you see the evidences and hints of how Paul's presence actually advanced. The gospel has advanced to Italians. Not only any Italians, but the, the uh, imperial guards of Caesar himself. So... I want you to know what, happen, what has happened to me has uh, really served to advance the gospel. And my prayer is that will be your testimony. Would anybody say amen to that? Amen. I really do, actually. You know, you, 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 you know, become a dentist, become a, I don't know, computer programmer, get a house, raise a couple children, to decent school, and you die. What's left? Really, what's left in your life? Okay. Secondly, it served the advancement of the gospel because, because of Paul's imprisonment, other Christians were encouraged and become confident in the gospel. Wow! You know, my, our brother Paul is willing to lay down his life like that we should too. I should too. I pray that my life would affect you like that. And my pray that our elders' lives will be affect you like that. And my prayer is that your life would affect other people and your children like that. Right? But it's kind of interesting because if you look at it, there are two groups of people who are preaching the gospel 
uh, in, in, in the situation where Paul was in prison. One with the wrong motives and one with the right motives. And it's right here. It's not very difficult. Most of the brothers, 14, verse 14, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak, uh, speak the word without fear. But some preach Christ from envy and rivalry. Interesting. There are people who would preach gospel out of envious. They were jealous of Paul. Paul's popularity. Paul's, like, his, his authority. His effecti effectiveness. Out of envy and rivalry. But others from good, good intention, good purpose. There are two categories. The latter do it out of love. Because they love the Lord. They love Paul. And they love the church and they love the gospel. There are people who preach the gospel with the right motives, right? Knowing that I am put in here for the defense of the gospel. You know, Paul was in prison. Hey, here's an opportunity to just kind of step all over him. There are always people like that. When someone falls, they, try, they look at it as an opportunity to just step on them. So coward. When, when brother falls, you should go and lift him up, right? But there are people who does that. And the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me. Their motive of preaching the gospel is to afflict Paul, to belittle Paul, to cancel his whatever he has done in his life. Really bad, isn't it? That canceling thing. Instead of have mercy, being merciful and try to lift him up. Not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So there are two categories of people who preach the gospel when Paul was in, in prison. But what's Paul's response? Very interesting. Verse 18. What then? Listen to this. What then? What matters? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, it doesn't matter. Christ is preached and I rejoice. Could you think about that for a moment? People are very, very fickle. I don't know whether you knew. People are fickle in marriage. People are fickle in commitment to church. People are fickle to commitment to even to Christ. Sometimes people preach with a good intention. Sometimes people preach out of you know, ill intention. But Paul think the way God thinks. It doesn't matter whether it is in pretense or in truth. What is proclaimed is the gospel, and in that I rejoice. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Okay. I want to go to the next three verses, which is the really what I wanted to share today. So what was going through Paul's mind while he was going through all of these? You know, he was arrested in, uh, in Jerusalem a couple of years ago, and he knew. In Acts chapter 20, he's saying goodbye to the elders at Ephesus, which is in Asia, and he's basically saying, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing exactly what's going to happen, but Holy Spirit is telling me that a lot of affliction and imprisonment is waiting for me. But I'm going to go there anyway. People try to stop him, but no, I'm going. In other words, God was leading him to there. So all the way from chapter 20, all the way to 28, what was the mindset of Paul? And that's what today's the key verse is about. 19. For I know that through your prayer, prayer of the church, of other Christians, and the help of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. He knew about his salvation. The word deliverance is uh, esoteria, salvation. He knew, and he had a confidence about his salvation. Can I just ask you? I'm asking, do you have confidence of your salvation? Are you confident about your salvation? 
Why is that important? I think it is important. I think it is important. Are you married? Shouldn't you be confident about that? Yes, I'm married. Pastor Paul Park, are you married? That sounds very <laughs> non-confident. He better be. He, I, I hope you are. I hope you know who your husband is. I hope you know who your Lord is. If you're not confident about that, you're going to live very, very confused and fickle. You are. In fact, you are living like that. But Paul is basically saying his theology, is, his belief is of the gospel is through the prayer of the church, other Christians, which is critical, but help of the Holy Spirit because he was regenerated Christian that I know I, it'll be for my deliverance, my salvation. My salvation is secure. He knew that. Okay? And then his expression, amazing expression, something that has been leading my personal life for the last for 35 years. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What is your life about? To live is Christ. I checked it this morning. The original word says, to be alive, Christ. To die, profit. There is no verb. To be alive is Christ. For Hung Min Son, Sony, I'm sure he has more than that, but to be alive is that victory. It's the soccer game. I'm not laughing at him. I respect that. I really respect that he's, he's, he's willing to do that. What is your life about? To be alive is what? To get a job? To get a little more salary? To get your child into Stuyvesant? Is that what your life is about? really want to ask you, Paul's added to what's said. My salvation clear, my purpose of, of life clear with the gospel. And he says in verse 20, I eagerly expect and hope. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed. How many of you are ashamed of the gospel? Are you confident um, about the gospel at work? Really, I'm asking you. And the reason I ask is because sometimes I, can't, I cannot be for certain. And if I am your shepherd and your uh, parent, should I not be concerned? Are you ashamed of the gospel? Because Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, when I return, I'll be ashamed of you. Are you listening? That's not a threat. Actually, it's a threat, but that's not a threat just to threaten me. If you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you when the Son of Man returns in the final judgment. But he's saying, I eagerly expect and hope in no way that I'll be ashamed, but I will have a sufficient courage which comes through the gospel and the Holy Spirit so that Christ may be exalted, from, so that now, as always, Christ may be honored and exalted in my body, in my life, whether by life or whether by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is profit. That's Christian gospel, people. Is that the gospel you believe? Okay. When I was in uh, graduate school, some years ago, I came back from missions, and I read this book. Uh, I shared this so many times, but I read this book that really impacted my life. And the title of the book is Shadow of Almighty by Elizabeth Elliot. And it's about her husband and other mission, uh, missionary friends. And this is the famous quote, he is no fool 
who gives what he cannot keep to gain which he cannot lose. He's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Some of you understand, some of you don't understand. I'm going to explain. He's basically saying he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep. What is that? Everything you have in this world, you won't be able to keep it when you die. None. None. Zero. Okay. My degree, my house, my savings, none of them you'll be able to take it. Nothing. So basically saying he's no fool who gives up those things that you cannot keep to gain what you cannot lose. If God calls you that heavenly inheritance and blessing and li living for Christ is given to you, and you cannot lose that because God has given to you as grace. So for you to give up, give that up, to gain that blessing, you are no fool. You're not a fool. Pretty amazing, isn't it? That's the Christian worldview. Is that your worldview? If not, you're not living with a Christian value. He's speaking the gospel language, isn't it? And I read this when I was in graduate school. I, was, I don't know, how old was I? How old was I? 26, 25. How many of you are 25? <laughs> don't raise your hand. Every day I was studying hard, and there is a quote by Jim Elliott in front of me. Lord, burn these idle sticks of my life. Idle, I-D-L-E. And may I burn up for thee. I seek not a long life, but a full one. You heard me share this. Every day, that was my motive of my study. Lord, burn these idle sticks of my life. And may I burn for thee. Seek not a long life, but a full one like the Lord Jesus. I way outlived Jim Elliot already. I way out even lived Jesus' earthly life. But that was my prayer. Do you know how old Jim Elliot was when he wrote this? He was a college student at Wheaton College. Along with his five, uh, five of them, five missionaries and their wives, they went to Ecuador, Aqua Indians. And uh, you know the story, in 1960s, five missionaries were killed by Indians. And his legacy and his life lives on. Really does, actually. He died in his 20s, maybe early 30s, but his legacy lives on. Okay. He's basically saying, you're living for this earthly things, you're a fool. The Bible says you're a fool. Look at me, people. You're a fool. That's why the gospel is the wisdom of God. Right? And if you don't live for that, I'm sorry, but you're living like a fool. The Bible is that God is saying you're, you're a fool. You are a fool. To live is Christ means for Christ, to Christ. I just want to close, people. Uh, some of you look exhausted. Some of you look neutral. Many of you look neutral. You know, we talked about this last Friday. I hope you are not neutral about the gospel. You can never be neutral about the gospel. You can never. Okay? When you stand before the cross... You either love him or you hate him. There's no neutrality. There's no neutrality. Paul is in Rome, right? Just as you are in New York. The center of the secular world. And you know it was the plan of God and orchestration of God. And it was through all kinds of suffering, imprisonment, difficulties. What was it for? What was, what was that about? 
defense of the gospel, confirmation of the gospel, advancement of the gospel. So Paul actually shared to the imperial guards and their families, which is crazy to think about, if you think about it, right? For a few years. And not only that, it strengthened the church because brothers were boldened and encouraged because of his imprisonment, they become more confident of the gospel. And I hope you really become confident of the gospel, not be mutual and silent. Because so many people are just so silent because you don't want to offend anybody. So what was it all for? It was the gospel of Christ. Bottom line. Bottom line, people. So we go back to the first question, and I hope you could answer this. What's the place of the gospel to Paul's life? More importantly, what is the place of the gospel to God's heart? That's a real question, isn't it? What's the, what is the place of the gospel in Christianity? Oh, I totally forgot to share this. I share this to bunch of you during the week, which is something that I really agree. By Kent Hughes, still alive, and he's a real good pastor in Whitton, uh, at Whitton College, actually, unrelated to Jim Elliott. When the gospel is no longer the main thing, when it becomes assumed, the next generation may be lost. And I was reading this this week, and I'm looking at Korean-American churches, and we lost the next generation. You are very, very minority of people worshiping God on Sundays. You know that, right? We lost the next generation. Why is that? Is it because culture? Is it because oh, it's so difficult to do church as an immigrant? Is it because oh, it was just so difficult to make living as immigrants, that's why we lost our next generation? Is that why? You think that's why? Is that why your friends and peers are lost for good? Is that why? What do you think? When the gospel is assumed, meaning when it becomes kind of like assumed. You think you have it. You think you believe it. You think you are living it. So other things becomes more frontier things, such as prosperity, such as good self-esteem, such as social justice. Gospel is assumed. You may lost, you may lose the next generation. You know why? Because there is no gospel. I hope you hear this. So my question to you is how central and supremely important is the gospel to Christianity and to God. I guess the implication is, what's the place of the gospel in your life? I think that's what matters, right? Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul wrote to Rome many years before he went to Rome. I really want to go there and, and, and share the blessings. But his plan was go to Spain for the furtherance and the advancement of the gospel through Rome and get like support and just go through France to Spain. That was his plan. And this is what he wrote. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Are you ashamed of the gospel? For it, the gospel, is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. Can we talk about the power of God? We talked about this uh, last Friday. How, how powerful is God? He could heal the sick, open the blind eyes, walk on water, all of that. Yes, powerful. He could part the Red Sea. He could part the Hudson River. He could annihilate Pharaoh's army. Can you imagine the Russia and Ukraine war over like that? God is able. But probably 
The greatest power that you could imagine is God make everything exist out of nothing. Creation. Powerful. It's really powerful. But Paul is saying, gospel is the power of God. You know, human beings don't change. That's why you're so upset right now. So anxious. You know, Christians, like people in church don't change easily. Look like they're changed, and then the real thing comes out. The really, they're really living for themselves. It's not the gospel. People don't change easily. But the gospel changes. Saul to Paul. He say, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God. That's his personal testimony. For salvation of everyone. If you are saved, it's because of the gospel. That's how important gospel is in Christianity. If you assume it, you're going to lose your next generation because there is no gospel in you. If you continue to assume it. If it is not the main thing in your life, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. It's not about the family. It really is. That's a lie. This life, Christianity is about the family. That's a lie. Christianity is about a uh, good marriage. That's a lie. Christianity is about raising our children really well in this country so that they'll be successful. That's a lie. Christianity is about bringing justice in this world so that there is no injustice. That's a lie. Absolutely lie. That's not going to stop until Christ returns. Right? Christianity is about the gospel, which is salvation. That's what history is about, isn't it? That's what history is about. God saving his people through his son, Jesus Christ. If it is not the main thing in your life, you will not have the future. That's what Kent Hughes is sharing. What's the place of the gospel for Paul? Basically, more than what it is, what his life is to uh, Hong Min Song, what the World Cup is. Do you think it's anything less than that? Do you think his emotion and passion for the gospel for Paul is less than that? No way, come on. It was everything to him, right? Everything that he's living for. So what is the place of the gospel to God? That's what this entire Christianity is about. That's his power, that's his wisdom. Apart from him, you're living like a fool. Brothers and sisters, for to me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. It's the gospel expression. It's the gospel expression. Let's pray.